this meeting and I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Are you able, Aditi, to share the slides? Okay, that'd be great. So as Aditi said, I'm so glad to be here. My name is Emily Sumner. I practice immigration law in Richmond, Virginia with clients all over the United States and all over the world. We are um, immigration lawyers who handle primarily employment-based uh, immigration matters, as Aditi was saying, and some family-based. So today we're talking about coming up with a plan. Before um, we started a minute ago, we were talking about um, how it's really nice sometimes to work with an immigration lawyer who is part of your culture, for sure. I'm sure that that is um, very nice. I obviously am not uh, from <laughs> anywhere except these great United States, um, but I do know what it is to have anxiety. I have general anxiety disorder and I've lived with it my whole life. And it is not fun. So that's the way that I connect with clients, knowing what that anxiety feels like, even if it's a different topic than immigration. Um, I don't want that for anyone. So I want you all to know what the path, what pathways are that are available to you and proactively come up with a plan. And know, even if you don't necessarily follow the same pathway that you set out uh, when you first start on this journey, you can still get to the same end result. So it may, I did a post on that yesterday on LinkedIn on how a person had started the green card process and he's almost there, almost to the end, but it took a very different path from what he expected. So let's go ahead and get started. ADT, you can advance a couple of slides to what is an H-1B. You all probably know, so this is an overview of topics um, and you all probably know what an H-1B is. We'll touch on that just briefly. Um, but we'll talk about what is an H-1B, an overview of the H-1B cap registration process, status-specific considerations, approaching your employer, um, and then what to do if you're not selected. So if you all would, if you would put in the chat what you're most interested to hear about, and I will try to spend the majority of the time on that. Um, and also, if you have questions as we go along, put that in the chat. I may or may not be able to keep an eye on that. Um, but I want to try to leave time at the end as well in case there are any questions. And of course, you can always contact me after the webinar if you have specific questions. As always, this webinar is intended for educational purposes only. It is not legal advice, and I can't answer fact-specific questions. So let's move ahead to Aditi as to what is an H-1B. Um, does anyone know, put in the chat, if you know what is an H-1B? And Aditi, you can go to the next slide. Anyone know what an H-1B is? Uh, if people Work can... visa for specialty occupation, yes. Work go. visa for specialty occupation, absolutely. Um, so the H-1B is a temporary visa classification. Um, it is valid for up to six years. It is, when we say specialty occupation, the regulations define that as a position that requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a specific field of study. There is a limited number of new H-1Bs available. In general, we'll talk about some exceptions, but new H-1Bs available every year. So that number is 65,000 plus an additional 20,000 for US master's degree holders. All right, next slide. So who is eligible for an H-1B position? We said a minute ago that it is a position that requires a bachelor's degree in a specific field of study. So tell me in the chat if you think that a position, uh, the position of clinical data manager, I don't know if anybody here is in pharmaceutical development, but tell me if you think that that is a specialty occupation H-1B type position. Can you repeat the occupation again, Emily? Yeah, clinical data manager. So it's that's somebody who works in a, different phases of the pharmaceutical development trial. And they work with data. Somebody says yes, Sunil says yes. Yeah, clinical data manager, yes. So I'm going with yes, especially because I've had that improved. Um, but it's a little tricky for USCIS sometimes because they think that you have to really educate them, make sure the immigration attorney is educating them really well on what the minimum requirements are for the position. So USCIS will look at something called the Occupational Outlook Handbook, the OOH, it's referenced here. And if they don't see the occupation and the OOH, which they probably will not, last time I checked, they will not for clinical data manager, 
Um, or if they look it up in the OOH and the OOH says, oh, a degree in engineering or business or physics or math is acceptable, USCIS is going to use that to come back and say, you don't qualify for an H-1B. So it's really important. It's not necessarily your job as the person, the H-1B beneficiary, but just know that that is the job of the immigration attorney to make sure that they're drafting, you know, they have a clear strategy for making it clear that this is an H-1B position that requires not just any bachelor's degree, but a bachelor's degree or higher in a specific field of study. So we have to be kind of creative with that sometimes. Um, in terms of the bachelor's degree, we can sometimes use a combination of uh, education and experience for that. So who is eligible? We can go back to the next, to the next slide, proceed to the next slide. H-1B cap. Have you all heard of the H-1B cap, the annual limit? Let me put it in the chat. The H-1B limit is in the regulations. The regulations say that there is an annual numerical limit of 65,000 regular H-1Bs and 20,000 for U.S. master's degree holders or higher. Um, the U.S. master's degree is... Uh, for, uh, it has to be from a, a university that, that is accredited and that is not for profit. And yes, the immigration attorney is typically one that the company uses. So I represent companies, corporations that hire foreign nationals and I'm the immigration attorney. Um, although I will say, that's a great question because I will say a number of corporate clients have come to us. They have become our corporate clients because an individual found us and they said, like the, sometimes the company will say, I don't have an immigration lawyer. I don't know how to do this. Go find somebody, figure it out. Um, and so the individual for our national will find us and then we'll connect with the foreign national and then eventually with the company and then get it done that way. So it is possible both ways, just depends. All right, next slide. So the H-1B lottery process. Guess, put in the chat, if you know how many approximately H-1B new H-1Bs were registered last year. And we'll talk about what I mean about the word registration, but how many people do you think wanted to apply for an H-1B last year? If you'll put that in the chat. And while we're waiting for those responses in the chat, um, just take a wild guess. Um, the, we'll talk about the application process. So it used to be, before the year 2020, it used to be that everybody would who wanted a new H-1B, all the employers who wanted a new H-1B for their employees or potential employees would file an actual uh, H-1B petition, meaning all of the paperwork, the LCA, all the forms that are required, the support letter, everything they would file with USCIS. Um, so I've seen 300,000 and 800,000 um, so far in the guesses. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So in 2020, the year 2020, nothing else was changing in March 2020, right? Super chill month. Ha ha. Um, but that just happens to be when this program rolled out. They changed the program so that we register electronically online. And typically, the company, the company does that, not an individual. You have to have a job opportunity, a job, uh, an employer to sponsor you. Typically, the sponsor, the employer will work with the immigration lawyer. So we register online. We'll talk in a minute, high level about that, what, what that looks like. There's a lottery um, that is done, and we'll talk about that process in just a minute. Next slide. So with the, electro with the electronic pre-registration <coughs> process, like I said, employers will register the beneficiaries. When I say beneficiary, I mean you, the foreign national who is wanting an, an H-1B petition. Um, so the employer will register the beneficiaries typically with the assistance of an immigration lawyer because it's not the most straightforward thing in the world. Um, the registration period is in March. So that's different. I had a, a potential client contact me this year, said, hey, I'm gearing up for the April filings. And I was like, no, you're not, because I didn't say that, but the registration is open in March, not in April like they used to. Um, so the registration period is in March, usually from the beginning of March for about three weeks. The registrations are employer and employee specific. So I know it says employee specific here, and that's true, but the employer registers with the employee's information. So in other words, an employer cannot put in 10 registrations and just be like, I'm just gonna find these people down the road. I'm not gonna worry about it now. No, we have to put in the individual beneficiaries information. Right now there's a $10 USCIS registration fee that may change in the potentially near future. Next slide. 
So the lottery process is, so we input all of this information electronically, we meaning immigration lawyers in connection with the employers who also get information from you, the beneficiaries. We input some basic information that we'll take a look at in just a minute. Um, and then USCIS will conduct a random lottery. It's a computerized, um, you know, data-driven uh, random lottery that they conduct. They will first select the 65,000 kind of regular caps, and then they'll select an additional 20,000 for the US master degree holders. They run that lottery before the end of March, on or before the end of March. And they notify us, the people who are selected by email and also on the online portal, if a case is selected. They do that at the end of March kind of instantaneously. Last year, I think it was like March 25th or 26th that we started getting notifications and we got notifications over a period of a couple of different, of a couple of days, two or three days. Once we have the notification <clears throat> that the case is selected, if we do, then we have 90 days to file the petition. So between April 1st and June 30th, next slide. So the lottery process, like I said, is USCIS will select 65,000 uh, registrations and then 20,000 US master's degrees. It is po US master's or higher. It is possible that USCIS would do an additional round of selections uh, later in the summer. That did happen this past year in 2023. We had a second round of selections in July. Does anyone know why that might have happened? You can put it in the chat. Why did we have an additional round of selections in July this past year? And while you're putting that into the chat, it did not happen in 2022. We did not have an additional round. I believe in 2021 we did. We had a second and third round duplicate entries. Yes, Yamuna, absolutely, duplicate entries. So let's talk about that duplicate number of applicants. So I said a minute ago, and in DT, we can go to the next slide. Um, I said a minute ago that we are that there's a it's employer specific so employers do the registration and i said that employers can't just say hey i want to sponsor 10 people and not know who they are likewise employers cannot sponsor the same person or can't register the same person multiple times so if they have an employee named uh amir syed just making this up then they can't register amir 10 times and be like hey we're going to increase amir's chances of being selected in the lottery that doesn't work um, that's prohibited, USCIS will likely find that and they'll have massive problems. So that's not allowed. However, if Amir had contacts or re, you know relationships with multiple employers, he could potentially have multiple employers register him in the H-1B lottery. As the way the, the way that the regulations are written right now, that's not prohibited. Personally, I think that there is some not really great behavior going on. I think it's possible and it's understandable. I think it's possible that people are, uh, foreign nationals are paying employers to register them in the lottery and it's not really a bona fide job offer um, in the hopes that they'll get selected. And I totally understand the chance of being selected is really not great. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, so I understand why that's happening, but that's the reason that we have such high registration numbers. Um, the, the chance of, of being selected is so low. It is possible there's, we'll talk about this in a minute. There's a new regulation, proposed regulation out that might change that. I don't think that's gonna be in place for this year, but we'll see. So status specific uh, considerations, and we can go to the next slide. There are some status specific considerations that you want to uh, take into account. Um, one is if you are in H1B, uh, sorry, if you are in F1 on OPT, and I'm going to talk about this kind of high level because I want to leave time about how to approach the employer and what if you're not selected. Um, so I'm going to go kind of high, high level, but I'm happy to answer any questions here. If considerations when you are being registered in the lottery are are you eligible for H-1B cap gap? So if you are on, if you have OPT right now, whether it's regular OPT or STEM OPT, if that OPT ends before the H-1B status would be, would begin on October 1st, then you can take advantage of cap gap. So it's only, the, it's only for those individuals who are on OPT, you have to be selected in the lottery. If your cap, if your registration was not selected in the lottery, H-1B cap gap does not apply. 
um, you have to apply for change of status, but just know that it is possible to bridge the gap, so to speak, if there is a gap between the end of your OPT and the beginning of H-1B status, which per regulation cannot start until October 1st. Next slide. STEM OPT. Have you all heard of STEM OPT or CPT? You can put it in the chat. So STEM OPT is for individuals who have a, their field of study is on a specific list. So you didn't understand the previous page. So don't worry about it too much. I'm saying that if you are selected in the, somebody just said just now that he didn't understand the previous page. If you're selected in the lottery, Okay, so your employer, you have a job, your employer uh, enters you in the H-1B lottery and you're selected in the lottery. Let's say that your OPT ends on June 1st of 2024. You file the, your employer files the H-1B petition for you before your current OPT expires, but then your OPT expires June 1st, 2024. So what do you do between June 1st, 2024 and October 1st of 2024? By regulation, the H-1B status cannot begin until October 1st. So that is even if your petition was approved, your H-1B petition was approved, let's say before June 1st, after June 1st, you know, whenever it was in July, you still would not be in H-1B status. So that provision, that H-1B cap gap would cover that gap automatically. You would automatically be authorized to work until October 1st. Um, so that's a, a very good thing, but you have to be selected in the lottery. If, again, likewise, if you are on OPT, um, you may be eligible for an OPT extension, a STEM OPT extension. So that means, I told you guys I was going fast, um, but I'm happy to clarify. Um, so STEM OPT extension is a 24 month extension of OPT. So you have the 12 months of OPT that everybody gets if you finish a degree program on F1. STEM OPT is an additional 24 months, which can be amazing because that potentially gives you an additional year or um, a di or two to, is this the same? I didn't catch that question. Um, it, it gives you a particular, uh, the STEM OPT gives you an additional year or two to register in the H-1B lottery, which can be amazing. However, your field of study has to be on a specific list. It's called, uh, they will look at your CIP, which stands for Curricular Instructional Program Code. It should be listed on your I-20. So if you're in school right now, I would check to see if your field of study is a STEM eligible, STEM OPT eligible field of study. And if not, it's okay. It doesn't mean that you know, you've messed up or anything, absolutely. There are plenty of people like me, language major, who don't qualify. I didn't have STEM OPT, obviously, but I wouldn't have qualified. That's okay. You don't have to change your career plans or your field of study. But keep that in mind if you go on to get a master's degree, that you may, sometimes it's a matter of a slightly different field of study, and you want to look at that list and see if you're eligible. CPT, we will talk about in just a minute. Can you advance the slide, please, DT? Yes, so Mohit says when filing for H-1B petition, there's a consular processing option. Uh, yes, that is possible. So when you file for an H-1B petition, we, we meaning immigration lawyers or whoever's preparing the petition, sometimes it's done in-house by employers. So there's a box to mark to indicate that we want the foreign national to be able to change status. It's called a change of status. That's the legal term or consular processing. Change status means that you, the foreign national beneficiary, want to change status from whatever you're on right now, let's say F1, sometimes it's H4, or sometimes it's L or L2, but you want to change status from your current immigration status to H1B. That means that you are changing status without, if it's approved, then it should be, but if it's approved, you would change status to H-1B without having to leave the United States, get the H-1B visa stamped, and then come back in. It changes automatically. You definitely want change of status if you are taking advantage of the H-1B cap gap that I just talked about. Because if you don't, if your immigration attorney does not mark change of status, then you are not eligible by regulation for the H-1B uh, cap gap provision. So that's really important. It may be that you do want to do consular processing. So we talked about what change of status is. Consular processing means 
hey, I want to go overseas, and typically it's to your home country, um, to apply for an H-1B visa when I'm ready. And I'll go apply for an H-1B visa and then come back in. That does not change your status. So let's say that you have, let's say you're selected for the H-1B and you have another year left of STEM OPT. You might want to work out that additional year of STEM OPT. Go ahead and file the H-1B because you have a limited time to file for the H-1B. But go ahead and file for the H-1B. It's only valid. You, know, you have to file within 90 days. Go ahead and file have your immigration lawyer ask for consular processing. And that way you can work out, you can finish out the year of STEM OPT. And then um, you can, when you're ready, go apply for an, a visa overseas. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So the number of petitions I, or the registrations, I asked you all a few minutes ago, what do you think um, was the number of registrations? This is a timeline of uh, the number of, it says registration, it says petitions, it should say petitions or registrations because it changed in 2020. Um, but it shows you the number of registrations received over the years. So somebody put uh, 800,000, yes, last year, almost 800,000 registrations received. Um, the year before that, it was almost half that, a little bit more than half that with 483, the year before that 308. So you can see it's really changed over the years and it's gone up and down, of course, over the years. Um, I personally think that in the years 2015, it wasn't that different, but 2015 to 2019, it changed a little bit just depending on what the economy was doing. Um, but then I personally thought there was going to be a huge bump in 2020 because the registration process was relatively easy compared to filing a whole petition, 74,000 more, absolutely. But then it's gone up tremendously from there. So I think it's partly demand, partly because of the ease of registration, partly because there are people submitting duplicate entries. Next slide. We'll skip this one. Let's go to the next slide. So this is just, and you all will get a copy of this um, presentation and you'll have all of these slides. So don't feel like you need to screenshot or anything. This is just a general overview of the timeline. Whether you are thinking of applying for an H-1B now or down the road, um, you this is the overall timeline. You would notify, you and or your employer would notify the immigration attorney that you're working with roughly in February. A lot of people reach out to us in January or sometimes the end of the year, the year before. Um, but know that this is the general timeline, usually by Q1, um, definitely by Q1, not usually definitely by Q1, but like January, February, you want to be working with an immigration lawyer. So you can register in March, have the outcome in at the end of March, and then file your petition um, April to June if you're selected or come up with a different plan. Next slide. And you can skip that slide. Let's go to the next one. All right, let's talk about approaching your employer. So you have, you, you are such great people because you've come to the United States. Um, you are foreign nationals here studying. And I have to say, we are so, so glad that you're here. I know it may not feel that way <laughs> that everyone feels that way, but I personally am very glad that you're here. This is a nation of immigrants. Um, and you all add so much to the United States in terms of the economy and culture and diversity and just good human beings. So we're glad that you're here. Um, but what do you do? You have this job, you have taken this brave step of coming to the United States, you have either finished your degree or you're working on finishing your degree. You finally have a job offer. What do you do? How do you approach them and say, by the way, there's an additional thing that I need you to do to be able for me to work long term. So here's a couple of things to know. One is that when you apply for jobs, and if you've been out in the workforce, you already know this. When you apply for jobs, an employer can ask this question. Are you currently eligible to work in the United States? And they can ask, do you now or in the future require sponsorship to continue working in the U.S.? Sponsorship means, and they may say in parentheses, for example, H-1B. Sponsorship means sponsoring you for an H-1B or for some other classification. It doesn't have to be an H. It could be an O or a J. There's, I'll, we'll talk in a minute about different classifications. They can ask you those questions. They cannot ask you, what country are you from? What is your immigration status? How long are you able to work? They cannot ask you those questions. Likewise, they cannot ask you or they're not supposed to not hire you because of the duration of your work authorization. They might do that in practice, but there's guidance out there that says that they're not supposed to, just so that you know. 
Um, so let's say that you have oops, uh, OPT that is valid for 12 months. They should not make a decision not to hire you just because it looks like you're only work authorized for up to 12 months. The flip side of all this is they don't have an obligation to sponsor. So they could hire you for your 12 month OPT duration and then say, you know what, we don't sponsor people for uh, for for each you know, for anything for immigration for H one Bs or for green cards or any of that. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully they know how amazing you are and want to do everything they can to help you. And honestly, there are lots of employers like that out there. Um, but just know that they do they don't have a legal obligation to sponsor you. The employer may want to wait. Let's say that you are hired on OPT and then you have a STEM OPT extension. If the employer knows that, they may say. You know what, we're not going to register you in the H1B lottery this year, or we're not going to submit the O petition for you right now, you know, whatever your plan is, um, because we want to wait. And they may give a reason they may not. It is your job as the foreign national to uh, be able to advocate for yourself, to inform them and to advocate for yourself and to say, you know what, I, you know, it's a difficult situation. And I know it's it's hard sometimes to speak up because you're so grateful that they even hired you and now you're having to ask them these to do these additional things. But I have had situations before where I've had a conversation with the employer and said, yes, the advantage of registering this year in the H-1B lottery is that if he's not selected, we have an additional two years if they have STEM OPT, for example. Um, so there are situations where it really is, even though it's a brave step to take um, and feels really daunting, it is valuable if you can to appropriately educate the employer as to what your options are and advocate for yourself. Next slide. So really quickly, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can look at the slides, but a lot of times people want to know, people meaning foreign nationals and companies want to know, well, what information do you need? They want to know what their kind of workload is going to be for registration in the H-1B lottery. It's pretty basic. Um, this is the information from the employer. And then next slide, information from the beneficiary from you. Um, things like your name, your gender, your passport information. Next slide. If you are selected in the H-1B lottery, it is an employer-driven process. So the employer would need to give their immigration attorney documentation, certain documentation, there are forms that they would need to review and sign. There is a labor condition application, not the same thing as a labor certification, which is a green card process, um, but labor, con uh, labor condition applications where they would have to review it and attest to these things that are listed here. So there are things that they would have to, to do. Next slide. The information from the employee, that's you, is the foreign national, is things like copies of your degrees and transcripts. If you have a credentials evaluation, you may not need that, but if you have a credentials evaluation, documentation of your immigration status. Next slide. So what do you do if you're not selected? Let's say that you go through all of these steps. You have a job, you know, you've graduated, you have a job, everything's going well, your employer agrees to register you in the H-1B lottery and you're so thankful. And then March 31st comes and they say, I'm sorry, but you haven't been selected yet. And by the way, the status online will not change if you are not selected in the March round of the lottery. It will say selected if you are selected and it'll just say submitted if you uh, were not selected. That's because they don't change that status until and if there's a second round. If there's a second round, you could be changed to selected. And then once they determine they've selected enough overall for the year, then they'll say not selected. Um, so let's say that you're not selected. Um, number one, my coping mechanism would be to go home and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's. You do your own thing, but keep it as healthy as you can. <laughs> um, but then regroup, take a deep breath and know that it is not the end of the road. Like I said, when I first started speaking, there are multiple pathways to get to where you want to go. And I know it seems daunting and like there are limited options. And it's, it, I will be honest, it is not an easy journey that you're on, but we are here to help you and there are other options. So think about where are you now? Where, what is your current immigration status? Can you continue on OPT? Um, for sometimes people will register in the H-1B lottery and the timing is such that even though they quote only have those 12 months of OPT, they're actually able to register the next year as well for the H-1B lottery. That's probably probably not a good idea to have that as your only plan, but that can be a backup. 
um, are you eligible for STEM OPT? And I'm trying to keep an eye on the questions, but we'll go through them in, through them in just a minute. Um, the STEM for STEM OPT, your employer does have to be registered in E-Verify. So that's something to keep in mind. I saw that pop up a minute ago. Um, if you cannot continue on OPT, not eligible for STEM OPT, can you start a new degree program? Some people really want to stay in the United States, and so they start a new degree program, let's say a master's degree or even a PhD. Um, and sometimes that can be a logical stepping stone anyway in your career path and or for various immigration options that we'll talk about in just a minute. CPT, has anyone heard of curricular practical training? You can put that in the comments. I'm going to come back to CPT while you all put, tell me in the comments if you've heard of um, CPT. Um, the other, another option is the um, cap exempt employers. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but know that there are certain employers out there that are cap exempt. And I have a post of, of this on my LinkedIn profile. If anybody wants it, message me on LinkedIn and I'll send it to you. Um, but there are organizations that are cap exempt. For example, um, the institutions of higher education, certain nonprofits that have affiliations with institutions of higher education, um, certain research organizations all qualify as cap exempt. So you don't have to go through this lottery process. CPT, anyone have a comment on CPT? I've seen a couple questions here. Do you do that now? Maybe Taman did you, does that now? Does um, CPT now? So CPT is curricular practical training, and it's designed for a situation where a foreign national student on F1 is taking a course or a series of courses that requires hands-on experience, like an internship um, done, yes, exactly, Sunil, done during an ongoing course. Um, so the course requires an internship, an externship, some sort of co-op experience, hands-on experience. Absolutely permissible. It's in the regulations. I keep talking about the regulations. That's because that's what governs all of... <laughs> everything that we do as immigration lawyers and advising people, um, but it's in the regulations, it's absolutely permissible as long as it's done correctly. CPT is not designed to be used as a substitute for an H-1B. It's not designed to be used. I have seen people who have been on CPT for literally years working full-time on CPT. That is not what it's designed for. There are certain universities that are known for they have regulations they have to adhere to, but there are certain regulations, certain universities that are known for kind of bending the rules or having loose interpretations in terms of CPT. And USCIS knows that and they know of those universities. So just know that if you use CPT, try your best to make sure that it's done appropriately. I'm not expecting, expecting you to read the regulations and interpret it. That's what I went to seven years of law school and 18 years of experience for. But do your best. Just know that it should only be used for a certain duration and know that if you do use it, then even if it's done permissibly, you know, according to the regulations exactly, it's possible USCIS will come back and ask about it. We have gotten several RFEs, requests for evidence over the years, and I always, always proactively warn my clients and say, hey, I see you're on CPT or you were before. Totally fine just know that USCIS is probably going to ask you for X, Y, and Z documentation. Okay, if you're not selected the documents for RFE, I, Mohith, I actually have a blog post on that. If you Google Sumner Immigration CPT RFE, you'll find it, or again, message me and I'll send it to you. Um, and it's not an exact list, every RFE is different, but it's a general list of what, you, what we proactively tell clients they might wanna have on hand. Um, think about other non-immigrant classifications. And again, an immigration lawyer is a great person to have this conversation with. Um, other immigration options. So are you eligible for an O? An O, I mentioned a minute ago, it, continuing your education might be a great option for you career-wise and or immigration-wise. If you're considering an O and then and or eventually an EB1A, which is the green card for foreign nationals of extraordinary ability, you do want to have a likely an advanced degree, a master's degree and or PhD. Um, and it's not absolutely required, um, but it can be helpful, especially, especially depending on your field. Um, so an O is for foreign nationals of extraordinary ability. The E2 is an investor visa um, and it has its treaty specific. So there's not a treaty with India, but there are treaties with other countries. E3 is for citizens of Australia. H1B1 is for citizens of Singapore and Chile. 
the J is used for all different kinds of things. Um, it can be used for short-term or long-term research scholars. Um, it can be used for au pairs, intracultural exchange. I have the TN is for Citizens of Canada and Mexico. I have on YouTube, and I'll have a QR code at the end that leads you to all of this. Um, but I have on YouTube a series called Sumner School Business Immigration Basics, which is a series of videos that are two to three minutes long on each of these immigration options. So if you want just a small snippet of what is an H1, what is a, an O1, for example, or what is a TN, um, then you can listen to that. Or maybe you need help falling asleep at night and you hear my soothing voice either way. Um, green card options. There are, I know it's a little challenging right now because there is a backlog of green cards. There always has been, but right now it's especially, especially backloggy <laughs> right now, unfortunately. Um, but it is possible over the years, I've had so many clients who have transitioned directly from F1 to an EB1A or sometimes an EB1B, the requirements are a little bit more tricky, um, potentially an NIW, depending on your country of birth, possibly a perm-based green card process. Those are all uh, a bit more detailed than I have time to get into right now. But just know that I have had a number of clients over the years um, transition directly from F1, for example, to these. I've also had clients transition, next slide, um, to transition, yeah, from OPT to, they've sometimes had to go overseas. We'll talk about that. Actually, right now, remote work, temporarily. Um, I want to tell you the story of this person that we filed the green card for, the I-45 for this this year, This actually this week. Um, so you may, I hate, as a U.S. immigration attorney, I hate saying remote work temporarily, right? Um, I, I don't want to send anyone outside of the United States, but sometimes it's a good plan. So it could set you up for an L visa in the future, which is for the international um, transfer of multi multinational companies. So in other words, if you work for a U.S. company, they have an office overseas, you go work there for a year, then they could potentially bring you back on the L. You have to work overseas for at least a year. Um, you could let the employment-based green card process play out. You could register in the H-1B lottery again if you're overseas. I have somebody in that situation right now, multiple people. Um, you could work on citizenship for another country. I talked a minute ago about um, some visa classifications and you're probably like, oh my gosh, Emily, I'm not Canadian, I'm not Mexican, I'm not from Singapore or Chile. Why are you telling me this is not helpful? I get it. Um, but I have, again, had a number of clients who have obtained Canadian citizen citizenship, for example, even though they were born in a different country, India, for example. I had that conversation with someone this week, just got her Canadian citizenship. She's eligible for a TN. So it's not the end of the road. This These particular visa classifications depend on country of citizenship, not country of birth. So let's talk about um, employment-based green card, letting that play out. And then I have a quick list of updates and then questions. I'm happy to answer you all's questions. Awesome. Um, so Emily, just a quick time. We're at 1244. We know that we only have till one. Uh, are you okay with staying like 10 minutes over if people have- Yeah, for sure. For sure. And this will be like two minutes more and then I'll open it to questions, but absolutely I'm happy to stay. Perfect. And if folks just preemptively uh, give you uh, like how the Q&A will work, if you have any questions, start raising your hand. And at the moment Emily is done, um, we are, I'm going to go through that list and take as many as possible up until we run to 1.10 p.m. But do not tune out uh, listening to Emily for the next couple of slides, because this is important information. <laughs> So I want to tell you about the person we filed the I-45 for. Um, he was working on OPT. He's a vet, okay? And a vet is not eligible for STEM OPT. So I say that because STEM OPT is not always intuitive. You think that a veterinarian, like an animal doctor, would be on the STEM list. He wasn't. Anyway, he worked on OPT. He went back to his home country. He was, uh, we start, the employer started the green card process. He was not from India, China, Mexico, or the Philippines, so not super backlogged. Employer started the green card process um, while he was on OPT. They, he was registered in the H-1B lottery two years. He was registered last year, not selected. Then he was selected in July. So all the mean, all those years, uh, you know, those two or three years, his green card process was playing out while he was back home working. Um, selected in July. He came here October 1st. Priority date is now current. And we filed the I-45. 
So it's, it goes to show that even though that path maybe isn't what he had in mind when he came here, it still works, still gets you to where you want to be. Upcoming changes, there is a proposed rule out that would increase significantly the USCIS filing fees. We don't know when that's going to become effective, um, but I did a post this week on LinkedIn. It went to the White House on January 8th, and so it could be coming in the next several months. There is a separate proposed regulation that would change a number of elements of the H-1B program. Um, yesterday, yesterday afternoon or maybe morning, USCIS announced that we will be able to file H-1B petitions online, which is exciting and scary because their system is not super great. <laughs> I always say if they would hire foreign nationals to set up their uh, online filing, then it would be beautiful, but they don't, so it's not. Um, 2024 elections, we don't know what's going to happen there. Um, I am sending all the good thoughts for positive outcomes for the good of everyone. All right, next slide is ways to stay updated. So take a, a um, QR code, you know, scan this if you want to, and it will take you to ways to stay updated with me. I talked a lot about LinkedIn. So I post on my personal LinkedIn page and there are all these other options. We have an email newsletter that comes out once a month, the first Wednesday of a month. We have social media, um, ways to sign up for future webinars that I do on a regular basis. So definitely do that QR and it'll take you to the page to stay connected with me. And with that, I want to first thank Aditi. Thanks so much for having me. I have really enjoyed this and I want to open the floor to questions. No, thank you so much, Emily. This is so incredibly helpful. Um, and just to know what the options are, when to talk with employers, just there, there's something that, that this lady uh, taught me in corporate America, it's called CYA. Does anybody know what CYA means? Anybody knows what CYA means, CYA means. It's called cover your ass. We, you need to cover your ass. That's 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 what it is. And knowing knowing how you can do it is step number one. So I know Vaishnavi and everybody has a lot of questions. Please raise your hand and I will go through it one by one. Emily is here with us till 1, 10 p.m. I know a whole bunch of questions were asked in the chat. This is your time one-on-one -on -one with, with an immigration lawyer. So Vaishnavi, go for it. Please keep it to one question so that we can get give an equal chance to everybody. Go ahead, Vaishnavi. Thank you so much, Aditi. And thank you, Emily. This is a wonderful session helping so many of us. I am having like one question. So I have completed my master's in the last year, May 2023. And I got my OPT. And I have started the OPT, but I don't know the employer is not E-verified. But the employer is like insuring doctors and they are in the industry from 1975. Just because they are less than 100 employees, they can't make it E-verified. So because of that reason, I can't apply to STEM OPT, but the company is completely like the original legit company that is from the past many years. And just because there are less than 100 employees, they can't do the e-verification. So what will be my next options rather than searching for a new job? What can I do? But they discussed with me regarding the sponsorship. They told me they can't sponsor me H1B. I'm okay with that, but not with the e-verification thing I am. I am I am not aware of that before. Yeah, thank you. I have to say I'm not either. The less than a hundred, I could be wrong about that, but I don't think I've heard that. Um, if you want to send me an email or send me a LinkedIn message, and I will look that up for you and send you an email or so email message me on LinkedIn, and I'll look it up for you and I'll get back to you. But let's say either way. It kind of sounds like they, uh, yeah, I agree. Mohit, Mohit said, somebody says that they have a company with 10 employees. I, I have never heard of that 100. I don't think that's a thing. So I don't know if they're misinformed, in which case you could, you know, like I was saying, inform them, you know, appropriately and politely, um, or if they just don't want to do it and they're kind of trying to make up an excuse. Um, I would see if you can figure that out. See if you can figure out if they just don't know. And like I said, message me, I'll, I'll message you the info. Um, but it kind of sounds like they don't want to do it. So your OPT, current OPT ends in May, 2024. Is that correct? Yeah, June, 2024. Okay, yeah. So I would figure that out, uh, have a conversation with them. So let me get you the information and then have a conversation with them and say, hey, that's actually not right. You can do E-Verify. And I will say it's a thing um, to do E-Verify. It's a, a, a burden, not a burden, but they're, you know, it's administrative steps that they have to do. So they may not want to, and they may just be giving you that as an excuse and they don't have to, to do a verify. 
So I would have a conversation with them, but I would also start looking at a different position to for a company that is e-verified um, and is willing to take you on with STEM OPT. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll just email, uh, connect with you on LinkedIn regarding this. Okay, yep, that sounds good. Mohit, go for it. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, first of all, for this session. This was really, really helpful. Um, and uh, so I had a very quick question, but there's a bit of like um, explanation to it. Essentially, I'm trying to find out what is, so I, I know that there's H1B petition, petition. I'm not sure if that is before or after um, H1B application. Um, but I was recommended that I go, I, I apply for the H1B consular slot. Uh, so I wanted to know which one should be chosen, like whether it's the change of status of uh, or consular. Um, let me be clear, like it, I was recommended by uh, an immigration lawyer to go to the consular slot. So uh, just wanted to know what's the processing advantage for the consular slot? Uh, what are the conditions? And uh, is the H1B petition before or after processing? Okay, good questions. So in terms of terminology, there's the H-1B registration. So are you, are you, Mohit, are you on H-1B right now? No, I'm on okay. uh, STEM OPT here. Yeah. Okay. So there's the H-1B registration that happens in March for those three weeks in March. And they haven't announced the dates yet, by the way. They typically do that in February. Yay. Thanks for the advance planning. Anyway, um, so there's the H-1B registration, which is that basic information, corporate information, employee information that's done online. They use that to run the lottery. If your registration is selected in the lottery, your employer submits an H-1B petition. There really is no such thing as an H-1B application. An application is something that <coughs> a person files for themselves. So you submit a naturalization application because you yourself are filing that for yourself an I-485 application because you are submitting that for your own green card. Petition is an employer saying, I want to sponsor Mohit for an H-1B. Um, so they would, if you're selected, they would file the H-1B petition. The question of consular processing or change of status really is a strategy question. And I can't tell you here and now, you know, what to do. I can't give you legal advice in this forum, but I can tell you what to consider. If you are looking to use STEM OPT, uh, looking to use these, um, H1B cap gap that I was talking about a few minutes ago, absolutely, you want to do change of status. Or if you're in a situation, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, where you have STEM OPT for another, let's say 18 months, 12 months, whatever it is, you may not want to give that up yet. You may want to work, you know, continue working on that and use it up, so to speak, and then make your H1B status effective later. And the way that you make it effective later rather than now is by selecting consular processing, the attorney would select consular processing on the petition. And that way USCIS knows, oh, he doesn't want his H-1B status to be effective right now. In order to make it effective, you would have to take that approval notice and apply for an H-1B visa at the US consulate. And I use the word apply. I would use the word application, H-1B visa application, because you're, you are applying for a visa. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Arvind, go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Hi. Uh, thank you, Artin and Lisa, for this wonderful lecture. I mean, I really learned a lot. So my question is regarding the O1 visa and it's a typical tool question. So currently, I just completed my master's degree and I have a bit of scientific publications in my relevant field. And can I, number, the first question is that, can I apply for an O1 while on a master's degree? And two, what are the class criteria required for applying for O1 in the first place? Sure. So, yeah, you can apply for an O1. Um, the employer has to, uh, there are uh, narrow exceptions, but in general, the employer has to, is the one to petition for an O1. So you do have to have, uh, if we're talking about O1A, you have to have an employer sponsor you for the O1. Yes, you can file for an O1 with a master's degree rather than having a PhD. I think that's your question. If you can do it with a master's instead of a PhD. Yes, absolutely. The regulatory requirements are listed, of course, online. Um, the requirements I always think are general, generally similar to the requirements for an EB1A. 
um, which is the foreign national of extraordinary ability. The standard for an O is a little bit lower in practice in my experience because it's not for a green card, it's for temporary visa classification. But in general, you have to show that you have, for example, publications, that you have won significant national or international awards, that you have made significant contributions to your particular field, things like that, very, very similar to the EB1A um, that you have to show. So it's not, it, it can be a really great option. We're starting an O1 now for someone in hopes that it's approved. And if it's not, we'll, we'll um, register them in the H1B lottery but it's not for everyone. And I'm not saying it's for you or not. I have no idea what your background is, um, but it's not necessarily easy to have approved. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sunil, go for it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for this wonderful session. So my question is, uh, currently I'm on H1B visa. I had my MS in IT before. And in case, uh, as a backup, like CYA, uh, I'm planning to have F1 in future if something happens to my current status. So going uh, with F1 with a master's in M as a IT or as an MBA is my question because MBA seems to be a general degree, not well, looks like a specialist degree for a specialty occupation. Mm -hmm. So as a backup plan, should I go for a master's in IT again, or which I have already done, or should I go for an MBA in IT? Tell me again what your current immigration status is. H1B right now. H1B? Yeah. Okay. And what do you want to do long term? Uh, I just want to continue staying here, uh, prepare for my EB2 and IW and then for EB1A. In okay. Future. So I, I think the answer to your question depends on what you want to do long term. You are correct that an MBA, that's a great point, that an MBA in general for an H-1B, if you just have an MBA with no specialization, then, and you just say, the, the employer says, yes, an MBA is required for this position, you're going to have a problem. USCIS is going to say that it's not a, even though it's a master's degree, it's a master's level yeah. degree, they're going to say there, there's no specific field of study. So if you did file an H-1B in the future, and the position required, uh, let's say you file an H-1B transfer or, you know, go back to school and go back to H, whatever it is. You file a new, a different H-1B base and the, require, the position requires a master's degree. You want to make sure that the attorney is noting the specialization. So I've had lots of cases like that. Like I filed for a, a COO, an operations um, officer, chief operations officer. He had an MBA, but we were able to get a specialization based on experience and education. And the specialization was in operations specifically, and it was fine. But to answer your question about whether you should go back to school, that's a larger conversation that I think you should have with an immigration attorney to kind of come up with a strategy for depending on what your goals are and what you want.